financialized capitalism that has expanded the inequalities that we've seen, there is a growing recognition that the ideology and the policies have failed. And what I want to talk about today is the dilemma that we face, that those policies and that ideology has been locked in through international trade and investment agreements that are designed to prevent us from finding a transformational and progressive new way forward. So the challenge to you is going to be to work with others of us in these communities to find a way to stop these agreements and to reverse that process so we can throw off the handcuffs on governments and force governments to act in the interests of people and in the interests that you have heard articulated this morning. I am an old Gramscian. I like Gramsci's notion of the interregnum. I see, we've got another Gramscian. That when the old is dying, and the new is yet to be born, we are an interregnum. There are morbid symptoms that are all around us, and we have heard of those this morning. But we have to shape what that new future will look like. It could be populist authoritarianism of the Trump kind. It could be pure, blunt authoritarianism of the various military dictatorships that we see. It could be reinvention of this failed model by and for the elites. Or it could be genuinely progressive and we have a responsibility to make sure that that is what fits the interregnum. Labeling of alcohol or tobacco. 
They are about not putting new restrictions and removing existing restrictions on services, whether it is the professions, whether it is advertising, whether it is health insurance, private hospitals, online services, all of those taking away the ability to regulate. New internet and data practices requiring governments to allow health data to be held outside your country in whatever country the company that is playing the data game wants to hold it with minimal protections in the rules in those countries and maximum ability to abuse, sell and manipulate that data. And new rules in these agreements that give corporations a guaranteed right to lobby when your government is thinking of adopting new health policies or laws. One of the most vicious of the rules in these agreements allows foreign investors to directly sue your governments if your governments introduce new policies or laws that will substantially affect the profit or the value of those companies, even if they have broken the law, even if they have caused massive harm to your communities. So many of the struggles in this room are about stopping big corporations from killing, maiming, hurting people and destroying the planet. Foreign investors have rights to challenge measures designed to address those issues. They define an investment as anything from a patent to a mining license to a privatized water contract to a public-private partnership hospital to a health insurance company to McDonald's, and the companies can bring these cases against your governments in secretive, private, offshore tribunals, not in your courts. The judges are lawyers who also act for corporations, who have no conflict of interest rules, and who have no accountability. There is no appeal from their decisions. Just last year, 65 new known claims were brought by investors. And I say known because we do not necessarily know if they are even suing our governments. Against 48 countries, which will mean a number of countries in this room. And the sums the investors claimed for those new regulations and policies ranged between $15 million and $1.5 billion. What is your health budget? Some examples. Of course, many of you will know about the tobacco disputes that Philip Morris has brought against Uruguay, against Australia, claiming huge amounts of money. For Uruguay, $25 million plus. In Australia, we don't know the exact number, but the documents said billions. In Canada, Eli Lilly, a US pharmaceutical company, sued Canada for $500 million plus when the Canadian court denied a patent for a new use of an old medicine. Ecuador is currently being sued by Pfizer for another court decision. In the Amazon basin, we know that Chevron, Exxon have caused unimaginable damage and harm, especially to indigenous peoples in uh, Ecuador. In a very long case, they claimed $96 million. They have now secured at least half of that. I want to 
does that mean for Ecuador's budget? Phasing out of nuclear power plants in Germany, a Swedish company claimed 3.7 billion. In Slovakia, a health insurer after health insurance was privatized. The, the government said, well, we now require private health companies to be not for profit. And in that case, um, $22 million damages was claimed. Now these damages are not what the investor has invested. They are the lost future profits that the investor expected from the long-term investment. So they have not even invested this money. Mining rights in Peru, a very recent case where the claim was for $31 million. In Vietnam, the closing of a private dialysis clinic, uh, which was not meeting standards, claim of 66 million against Vietnam. Now, I've gone through that in some detail because I want to stress the enormity of this. Um, there are two important points to take from this. Even when states win these cases, even if they have costs awarded to them, those costs do not cover what they spent. And even if they are awarded to the government, the investor does not pay in one third of those cases. So what does this mean then for your health policy decisions? The goal of the investor is to get your governments to back off making those decisions and to scare governments of other countries, the same will happen to them. In these agreements, there are chapters called transparency chapters. Not so we can see what is happening, but so that the investors are consulted before the government adopts new policies or regulations can make their views known, can table reports from friendly academics, can demand answers, can demand reviews. Another set of rules says the approach to solve the problem must impose the least burden on the commercial interest possible. So you educate people not to do bad things rather than regulating the activities of the company. And these now are becoming internalized in decisions of our governments because they fear the consequences of being seen to break the rules. And the trade ministries are now becoming more important in health policy than the health ministries. The good news is that this system is imploding. It is so outrageous. There are such backlash and movements internationally that there is a state of crisis in these agreements. Countries are withdrawing from these investment agreements. South Africa, Tanzania, Indonesia, India. They are saying that they will not play by these rules. We are seeing even in North America for all the evils of Trump, that Trump is burning down the neoliberal model. He is replacing it with something really bad, but it shows that there is not no alternative. There are alternatives, and they can be fought for. China is another disruptor. The system is not going to continue as it was. So-called progressive governments claim that they are now responding to this. They are being inclusive. They are concerned about empowerment of women and empowerment of indigenous peoples and small businesses. And in reality, it is business as usual. We have a few nice words being thrown into agreements. They call them trade for all like health for all, but nothing is going to change. In fact, they are stopping the momentum of real change. So the message 
that I want to make uh, and pass on to you here is, if you want to keep the space open for your health policies, first we need to stop new deals. There are very successful examples where we have done that, and we have worked closely with health communities to achieve that goal. Some governments are being forced no longer to be secret. We call it the Dracula Principle. If you bring it into the daylight, it can wither and die. We are having demands for human rights and health impact assessments to be conducted during the course of these negotiations. We have some countries demanding, in Latin America especially, demanding referendums before governments can adopt these agreements. We also need to terminate the agreements that are already there. And that is to the fore in the investment agreements. And we have many countries now looking seriously at doing that. But they need to be brave. And we need to help them to be brave. There are also some carve-outs for some health policies in these agreements. Tobacco or even health policies more generally from the investors' rights to sue, but they don't help all the other health problems. What we need is to develop real alternatives. And some of that is happening. Ecuador is taking the lead at present in the UN Human Rights Council for a binding and enforceable instrument to force transnational companies to comply with human rights rules to be enforceable in the host country and the home country. We have uh, other alternative investment regimes. South Africa is best. South Africa says foreign investors have rights in our domestic law subject to the South African Constitution. And that is because South Africa got sued for action under the post-apartheid constitution for redistribution according to the constitution. And so they and others have really good examples. Now if you, if I have caught your interest by this, there is another session in the next session on trade and health and there is a session on access to medicines tomorrow and the biggest threat of that on access to medicines is these agreements. Then there are, at the end of the day tomorrow and the day after, strategy discussions about how we can really turn the interregnum into a victory for the people. Now, in New Zealand, uh, when activists finish, we have a, a slogan and if you forgive the cultural appropriation, we, Maori are very active in this, this process as well. Uh, and it is, The people will fight on forever and ever and ever.
inclusive growth, urbanization, and quality education. That's quite a challenge. Let's see what he has to say. Thank you, Yaro, once again. I have to admit that I cannot uh, match the passion and the so range of uh, global views that was shared a little earlier. Economists, I think, are a bit short on the fashion side. Uh, but I would supplement uh, the discussion so far here with a look at a fill, take a fill lens to the issues that has been brought about. And we start off with a look at the Bangladesh Sea and how we can read the data in terms of understanding the challenges ahead. Okay, first I, I want to put it in terms of there are indicators of both. Meaning progress has been achieved. It's not like a bleak landscape. Child and maternal health, we have impressive achievements. Life expectancy, 25 years we've added since independence in 1971. Sanitation, open definition, almost zero in Bangladesh. We have improved realistic care delivery, public, private, social. We have, what is optimized here, a domestic pharma industry, which is why you can find a pharmacy in the remotest villages for your essential medicines. We have many types of uh, development process innovations despite the odds and we have a policy visibility on specific agendas like disability etc. have come into focus in recent times. So there are, you know, the record says that there are indicators of hope but there are also uh, there are what I would call the statistics of despair. Meaning that sometimes uh, political actors read the indicators of hope in a very uh, feel-good fashion. And we need to look at the fuller picture. And as you can see, life expectancy is 72. But healthy life expectancy is much lower than that. Under 5, mortality has gone down, stunting at over a third of children are actually stunted. Coverage of essential health services, you know, nearly half don't have that. Skill personnel, uh, work attendance percentage still quite low. Catastrophic health expenditures, which is 10% plus of the income. That's a massive problem all over the world and in Bangladesh too. I think these are actually official WHO data, it's not our data. And because of that, nearly 5.25 million people are being pushed into poverty, are at risk of being pushed into poverty every year, despite all the indicators of hope that we look at. Okay. And health expenditure as percentage of GDP still remains fairly low. So, <coughs> questions to ponder. <coughs> so, I think uh, I have been listening since morning to this whole discussion, and one of the emerging challenge areas I find in terms of discourse is that there is a when Almata took place in 78, there was a, I'm sure there was a, a, you know, I've come new, so I must, might be mistaken in my understanding of that, that the focus was on health care. In 2018, the focus has to be on health, which is larger than health care. Health, because of climate change, because of unplanned urbanization, so many other issues, health is a much larger agenda than health care. And that's why we have to ask this question that we have added life expectancy, but people are not feeling healthy. So there's a problem there of a fragmented progress actually. We have 8,000 plus doctors being added to the workforce every year. 
but quality concerns are you know getting even louder. In poor and middle classes, because of the out of pocket expense burden, it's not just falling on the poor, it's falling on the middle class too, in terms of uh, putting people at risk for being uh, falling into poverty. We have a huge problem of people looking for health care and the process of finding where to go is part of the big challenge of health care. Not just the delivery itself, but the finding process. And in Bangladesh, that's a massive issue. We focused on rural poor earlier years. Urban poor in Bangladesh too are like an abandoned group in terms of focus on health care. And the over commercialization of health care that was referred to, I have been trying to look at what are the specific consequences on which we need to look at. And you know, the pharma diagnostic doctor nexus, which is driving up unreasonable cost, that's a nexus which is extremely well entrenched. We have within the state system, Doing, you know, just making the public sector larger doesn't solve the problem. Is there is massive wastage within the public sector, and we have a problem of the irrational procurement syndrome in Bangladesh, where hospitals are being pushed to take equipments which they, which are, the ones which are not really needed, and that's part of the, uh, you know, business uh, working through the state system itself. We have this unjustified cost increases. Medicine cost was low in Bangladesh, now it has really shot up and medicine currently constitutes 60% of the out-of-pocket expense. And we have a new problem which I don't know in your in other countries, we have now a quality of the medical education is emerging as a massive potential problem down the line. Doctors getting becoming doctors without appropriate tra training, without access to clinical training, and therefore putting the entire patient community at risk. And we find increasingly doctor-patient relationship, always in you know, a social, uh, as, uh, there's a huge media attention on this that is personal. So the record is one where we have progress, but we have massive unfinished agendas as well as newer agendas which have to come forth and therefore we need a lot of rethinking in terms of how we are approaching this issue and I will you know end of this final slide my take on what are some of the components of a potential transformative health agenda of course, you know, I think that this was mentioned, the paradigm of health in the context of climate change, in the context of unplanned urbanization. Injuries, for example, account for a massive amount of incidents, deaths. Injuries are coming because of, partly because of unplanned urbanization. It's a massive problem. We have to deal with that. Also, the, because of, you know, the uh, lifestyle was mentioned in the morning, it's a very important issue for the rise of NCDs. So there is a restate, reimagining the paradigm in the context of these new realities. I think it's a challenge. We'll have to find the answer for that. And we have to... You know, I'm very glad that the health uh, trade ministry has been brought into the discussion. But we need to bring in many other ministries, including the prime minister's office, into the discussion. Because many of the decisions which impact on health are actually not made in the health ministry. You know, for example, Dr. Zafrullah, when he's running a social hospital, he's having to pay commercial rate for the use of electricity, which he's using for the health care which is a decision not by the health ministry. It is decision elsewhere. And therefore, I think mainstreaming the health discussion is a challenge 
in which we have to bring in other stakeholders also into the discussion. And here, obviously, why out-of-pocket expense is a driver? WHO's focus on out-of-pocket expense of UHC, uh, universal health coverage, it also has a focus on that. But I think a part of that agenda, which has not been discussed sufficiently, is why is out-of-pocket expense very high in the first place? It's not just because there is no social insurance or others. A huge part of this out-of-pocket expense is unjustified costs. Therefore, cost reduction in the Bangladesh context, you know, Dr. Zafrullah you know, has been championing this about uh, stent, the little material for heart stent. The value of that has now drastically come down once people really attended to that. This was a totally unjustified cost. Across the board, you can find many instances where out-of-pocket expense is not just a burden we have to defray by appropriate insurance mechanism. We have to first ask the question, why is it high in the first place? And therefore, try and get the unjustified elements of that into our control. So I think that's a very important issue. And for the getting the Prime Minister's office involved, we have to, in a way, give them the type of arguments by which they will see why focusing on health is politically intelligent. And I see that there are two types of argument which we have to make. One is that if you do not address out of product expense issue, you are increasing poverty. So there is an interest there, they want to reduce poverty. There is also a counter, uh, opposite argument that countries like Bangladesh and many others are no longer in the poorest status. Already we are in lower middle income. We are hoping to become middle income. Therefore, the issue about health is also about productivity. It's about the health part of it, not just the access to health care part of it. So if you are wanting to invest, if you want to invest in health, you have to invest in better cities. You have to have the parks, etc., green spaces which allow pollution to go down. You have to invest in all types of other areas by which health will be produced, not just health care. And therefore, that's an argument that health is a two-dimensional agenda. It's a poverty driver if unaddressed, and it's a growth driver if addressed well. And that's the type of argument which, to end your intergenal, we have to make it, really, because we may, I mean, it should not be too long, isn't it? before we get a new paradigm. And these, to do this, the reason I actually have felt very motivated uh, trying to get a bit of depression from the interacting with the health people is that we need these cross-sectoral conversations. We need multi-sectoral coalitions. Myself, an economist, we have teamed up with doctors and Rafullah is also there. Uh, we have uh, set up a platform called Healthy Bangladesh as a way of driving some of these agendas. Try to broaden the idea that this is a larger agenda. It is beyond, beyond sectoral understanding of health per se. And I think uh, we have been working with, for example, city mayors to try to interest them that public health is an agenda which is in their own interest, not just some infrastructure development. Public health is also a city government's agenda. And these are like, like new actors who have to be brought onto the table. So, I think the, what I'll add that we need a triple action agenda. Of course, one is health care. It has to be about public health also. Sanitation. Fecal sludge management. I don't know how many people are aware of this new acronym called FSM. It's a fancy name for non uh, you know, it's a fancy name basically, for waste disposal, human waste disposal. In 10 years time, FSM will be a talking point all around the world, because cities will not function if FSM has not been addressed appropriately. And already, many of the cities are not functioning because FSM is not being 
even if the, uh, the appropriate solutions are not coming forward. So public health is very important. And what I will also say that we have to promote health itself. Preventive, yes. But promoting health itself is a key agenda. Healthcare, and I think I my personal sense is that if we want to not, if we want not just to speak truth to power, but also to occupy the driver's seat, we have to uh, take on this challenge of being the champion both of healthcare but also health itself. And I end by saying, if we want to do that, we have to transform health into an aspirational agenda. It has to be aspirational. And I know the previous paper and the neoliberal agenda was uh, was mentioned. And in, in economics also, we you know they are very familiar villains, so to say. But I think those who work on the ground, there is another villain. Which is not about ideology, which is as insidious or to an extent even more significant than this ideology is what I would call corrupt and sort of uh, jealous bureaucratic inattention. The bureaucrat who couldn't be bothered to think about an issue which will help a lot of people is not being driven by ideology. He is driven by petty interest, by a lack of attention to some issues. We, so, in this health discourse, one fight frontier obviously is this ideology level, where we have to promote health. But this reality is this corrupt bureaucrat, bureaucratic inattention, and there exists in, you know, all, uh, I'm, I'm sure in all societies, corrupt, inattentive bureaucrats, but who are extremely jealous of their jurisdictions. They don't want to release any of their jurisdictions. They are also a, that's a second battleground on which we also have to fight. So I'm sorry, I am not I don't haven't got that passionate level up yet to give a slogan, but I'll just say that these are some of the frontiers on which you have to fight on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hossein, for sharing with us your perspective on what is happening here in Bangladesh. And for those of us who come from other countries, it's interesting to hear your perspective. Now I would like to introduce somebody who all of you know, <laughs> Amit Sensek Gupta from India. He is a medical doctor and he's a health activist as well. And he's been responsible for for that work that was done over the years on the Global Health Watch.
assure you, I had a very nice presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Eduardo Spinoza said a lot of what I wanted to say, if I may say so, in a much more beautiful language. What was left of it, Professor David Sanders, he even used some of the slides as well. <laughs> and then we had two, uh, two speakers uh, who more or less said whatever little I had left. <laughs> so, I'm going to go back to what I feel most comfortable in which is to think of myself 18 years back and think of myself now and not just myself but the world around us and think of what has changed. Has anything changed? Yes. There's much more wealth in the world. There's much more money in the world. You can see it on the streets of Kinshasa, in the streets of Dhaka, in the streets of Bogota, not just New York and London. We have a lot more money. We have a lot more knowledge. In 18 years, you didn't have a cell phone. If somebody 18 years back had told us in Sawar that you can use a cell phone to translate, nobody would understand that. There is a lot more knowledge, knowledge that can, that has the potential to transform our lives. It is knowledge, it is the collective knowledge of human endeavor, which never stops. So we have a lot more knowledge. But, okay, I love this book. But, this, at least, I have learned something very important. That when people are dying, what is important is that the banks need to be saved. In 2008, when the global economy was collapsing, what was the message that went out? The banks are too big to die. So what we have learned in the last 18 years is about the power of money. That money keeps us going. We knew that. We knew a bit of that 18 years back. But we have learned how important it is that money needs to be safeguarded, not people's lives. And we have learned, these existed in the dictionary, but we have learned them afresh. Austerity. Austerity, the monster of austerity, hiding behind a nice sounding word. The deaths of thousands and tens of thousands of people. Of babies going hungry. My country. I come from a country which people believe is, is an emerging economy. What is an emerging economy? <coughs> we don't know. What we do know is that a large number of people still in this emerging economy, the poster boy, India is the poster boy of neoliberal capitalism. In the poster boy of neoliberal capitalism, we still have a very large number of children who go to bed hungry. Knowledge, the medicines, new medicines, we have some, not enough, but we have some, but only for some. So I want to salute the spirit and this is what the last 18 years has taught us that the pharmaceutical companies, the big behemoths that we have created can be defeated by poor activists when they come together. 
the spirit of South Africa, the spirit of India, the spirit of the HIV community has shown us that Big Pharma can be defeated, but the battle still goes on. Big Pharma, what we have learned in the last 18 years, they can produce a drug which they would like to sell for $1,000 for one pill. $1,000. Take a deep breath, think about it again. One tablet of a medicine called suppose Bubi, which treats people <laughs> with a deadly kind of hepatitis, a liver disorder, was costed by the American company Gillian Sciences at $1,000. So, Big Pharma, in spite of our struggles, continue. In the last 18 years, iniquity has grown. You heard that before. So we have eight people. Some of the statistics are so startling, we just read them and go on. So I want you to close your eyes, think about this. Eight people, just eight people have more money, have more wealth than half the human race. That is the kind of iniquity that we have built in the last 18 years. Well, David Sanders, not a good thing this is. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, so this is one way of looking at the map where people are dying. People die. People die everywhere. But when children die, when they don't need to die, it's a crime. And these, the bloated components that you see, the continents that you see, Africa, South Asia, you have people dying. And then, you have the other bloated continents where all the money lies. So Africa has almost disappeared. If the map of the world is based on where the money lies. India you can barely see there, or South Asia. And you have huge North America and Africa. But that's part of the story. Today, in Europe, in North America, you have people dying who should not <coughs> So you have, in the last 18 years, we have also learned that finally, the hunger of capital has crossed borders into the belly of the beast. The hunger of capital today haunts Europe, today haunts North America as well, and not just uh, our countries in the South. <coughs> so one of my best memories of Savar in 2000 was sitting with our Palestinian comrades. Was sitting with their Palestinian comrades and, and for me, who much of my student activism, we would march for Palestine. But we hadn't actually seen too many people from Palestine. It was one of the memories that we took back from Palestine. In this last 18 years, Palestine has shrunk further. And we have a world which is blind to what is happening in Palestine today. And Palestine continues to suffer. But it's not just about Palestine. Palestine is a symbol of another kind of hunger of global capital. It needs wars. Global capital needs the armaments industry to survive. Remember that. It is not just, just about, yes, it is also about marching into Iraq in 2003 because it needs oil. But it also needs wars. And so, in the last, 2000, in the last 18 years, we have seen how country after country can be devastated 
because the armaments industry needs to survive. And so these are Syrian refugees. This is a refugee boy. These are children in a refugee camp. There's a small story behind it, behind this picture. Uh, these are pictures by a Turkish doctor. Uh, he was proposed as one of the speakers here. But unfortunately, he cannot travel out of the country. So there's a story within a story. Uh, so we have millions of people being trapped, being pushed from one part of the world to another because the hunger of capital demands that entire countries be devastated. Global trade, you heard from Jane and I don't think I have anything to add to that. And then in 2000, we thought there was a WHO. We thought there was a UN system, United Nations. We used to take pride. WHO is going to attend our meeting. We used to take pride in the fact that there is a, a United Nations, which for all its faults still exists and is neutral. It takes into consideration the needs of countries, of people in countries. So this is the United States and this is what it has been replaced by. Well, it's not one man. Uh, I heard it's a good, good picture. So. But the point is, the global governance, which was supposed to be a nation-state different process, has been replaced by what is called philanthrocapitalism. Very big word, very difficult to understand. So I'll put it simply. Andrew Carnegie, about a hundred years back, who many people say was the richest man ever to have been born in the world, a hundred years back, Andrew Carnegie said that the government should not make laws but should allow the rich people to give money in charity. So the more rich people you have, the more charity they will give to the poor people. That is in a sense what Andrew Carnegie uh, said. And this is what we have now under philanthropic capitalism when billionaires today determine policies because they are giving some of their money in charity and can replace. So remember that the biggest donor of the World Health Organization is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So there's something that we have learned last year. The hunger of capital does not stop at bare mortal. It wants to devour our planet. And as David was saying, one planet is not enough. They need more than one planet to satiate their hunger. And we are hurt early. So in 2000, climate change is something that only a few people talked about. Now, even the Brazilian president, who yesterday said that climate change is a Marxist conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> so even the Brazilian president knows the word climate change. <laughs>
it's not right to say that health is something that we demand. It's not right to say that health is a right. What is right is to say, if you have money, you can buy health from the market. So I'll finish here by reminding ourselves that the evidence of the health crisis is all around. These pictures can be from anywhere in the world. We can just change the faces and they can be from anywhere in the world. The struggle for health is a struggle for a more caring world. And I think that's what we are here together to build a more caring world. If I can finish, I don't have a slogan. We are running out of slogans. They used it all up in person. Uh, I don't have a slogan, but I will end by the immortal words penned by Bertolt Brecht when he said, Will there be singing in the times of darkness? Yes, there will be singing of the times of darkness. Thank you very much.